the sentiment, uh, you know, recently has been quite poor uh, going into this year. A lot of companies that were doing well, uh, we're not getting credit for it. Uh, we characterize 2022 as a year where the macro really overwhelmed the micro at, at companies. And that negative, uh, uh, that, that narrative, that pessimistic narrative that had taken over really created a great opportunity for stock pickers. And, you know, that that's, you know, we think uh, what helped lead to a good start to this year. And, and we like, uh, you know, from here as well. Hey, everybody, I'm Samuel Burke, Managing Editor here at Real Vision, and we really want to thank you for all the feedback you gave us on the last episode of Three Ideas. We hear you loud and clear, and that's why we really think you will be thrilled with our next guest. That's Eric Udoff, Managing Partner and Co-CIO at Marlowe Partners. Eric, welcome to the program. You have very different investments here, and to be clear, these are all companies that you are invested in. But before we jump into your three ideas, I do just want to get your global map macro outlook here as it relates to what we're going to talk about on the show. Great. Yeah. Well, Sam, thanks for having me. I uh, look forward uh, to having this conversation. Uh, so, yeah, so from a high level, uh, when we think about the macro, we're stock pickers. So we look first at how our companies are doing. And most of the companies that we're invested in, uh, they're doing very well right now. Uh, zooming out, when we look at the economy overall, uh, the big thing, everything right now is still downstream from inflation in our view. And it's getting better if you zoom out, you know, certainly since uh, June of last year, the year over years have been coming down. And it looks like, you know, we're, we're winning that inflation fight over time. That's sort of the end point. Uh, you know, the path to getting there uh, is less clear, but we are heading in the right direction. And to us, that gives us, uh, you know, a lot of confidence. You know, if you look back, uh, a lot of people uh, will reference, you know, the great inflation and, uh, you know, back into the 70s, when Volcker took over in August of 79, during his roughly eight year tenure, uh, the S&P 500 had a total return of 21% annualized per year. So if you do beat inflation, if that is the end point, uh, that's a good backdrop for investing. Uh, additionally, you know, looking at it from a different lens, uh, the sentiment, uh, you know, recently has been quite poor uh, going into this year. A lot of companies that were doing well, uh, we're not getting credit for it. Uh, we characterize 2022 as a year where the macro really overwhelmed the micro at, at companies. And that negative, uh, uh, that, that narrative, that pessimistic narrative that had taken over really created a great opportunity for stock pickers. And, you know, that that's, you know, we think uh, what helped lead to a good start to this year. And, and we like, uh, you know, from here as well. Well, let's jump into your first idea, and that's Top Golf Callaway Brands. And this is a sports equipment manufacturing company. Uh, you're interested in their golf venues, which are uh, akin to a high end bowling alley. In your view, let's just take a step back and look at the, the stock over the past few years. In March 2020, we saw it bottom out around $7.22 and then peak in May of 2020 run, 2021 around 36.92. Uh, October 2022 was its most recent low at about $17.12, currently trading around $24. I, I was a bit surprised as I took a look back at this company because you would think in this post uh, peak of the pandemic, let's call it, where so many people want those in-person experiences again, that this company would have fared much better, especially in the past year. So walk us through this company. Tell us things that we wouldn't know if we would just do a Google search and why you still think it's an interesting time to get in. Yeah, happy to. Why don't we start you know, high level on the industry and on the company? So uh, golf overall is a healthy is a healthy industry. Uh, starting in 2017, uh, you can look at the graphic. You can see that the number of people golfing on course has been going up, uh, as well as you have a lot more people swinging golf clubs off course as well. So the sport is really growing. Uh, it's taking in a, a wider demographic, uh, and it's getting a lot more people interested. Uh, and so uh, that has been really good. And the pandemic actually helped that. So. Uh, what you saw happen is as people had more time working from home, more flexibility, and also maybe just a more more of a desire to spend time outside, more people have been golfing. You've seen rounds played up significantly as well in the U.S., and it stayed at these higher levels. So that's a starting point backdrop. And then the company itself, Callaway, Callaway is a very well-run business. So uh, the current CEO, uh, Chip Brewer, he came in in 2012. 
And since he came in, he's done a very good job making some strategic decisions with the company, some good acquisitions or dispositions, depending when. And the company in the core golf business at Callaway, you know, golf clubs and related apparel has gained market share. And then uh, they've also made some good acquisitions over time as well. And we think this most recent Top Golf one is another uh, great example of that. So, you know, the company uh, uh, Callaway had a minority stake in Top Golf and the pandemic hit. And so uh, that's when we started to get interested is when uh, Top Golf was looking to go public, the pandemic hit, they pulled the IPO, they wanted capital to keep growing. And uh, in an opportunistic way, Callaway came in and bought the company. Uh, you know, venues were primarily shut down. There was a lot of uncertainty, and they they used that moment to to take over Top Golf. And since then, everything has done better than planned. So, you know, why do we like Top Golf overall? Well, it's this great concept uh, when you look at the numbers. So, uh, the it's, you know roughly thirty million dollars for a typical venue when you build it, you get forty fifty percent cash on cash returns. You survey consumers; they like it. You know, they they open a new venue, you're going to see multi hour lines. Um, and it had always been, uh, you know, in recent years under venture capital, uh, a very good business uh, that was growing mainly by opening new venues. And there was an opportunity as it gained scale and uh, as it gained scale and, and as they um, sort of maybe were more thoughtful about operating in a way to focus on profitability and growing same store sales uh, for it to be even better. And I think that's what we've seen since Callaway has taken ownership of Top Golf, so you've gone from you know buying something uh, in 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 you know the worst part of the pandemic to now exceeding you know long term targets uh, that uh, you know were initially set out for the deal. Yet the stock hasn't done a whole lot. Uh, so as you mentioned, um, you know when the deal was announced, the stock was around twenty dollars a share. It initially got traction and rallied to about thirty seven. Uh, and then about a year and a half ago, there were a few factors that, you know, caused headwinds for the, the stock to go down. In our opinion, we would kind of put it on people thought that, well, it's company's a pandemic winner, uh, looking at the core golf business, people golfing more. So maybe that is a reason to, to not want to own it as much, uh, just people expecting the consumer, uh, to pull back. Uh, but that really hasn't happened. And then uh, finally, these venture capital investors who were involved uh, early on in Top Golf, they had been selling their shares uh, in a way that you know put a lot of pressure. It was a significant percentage of the volume at different moments over the past year and a half, and we're almost through that. So uh, you know, as we look uh, in March, that's the last tranche. Uh, and so you know, from here we see a company where half the EBITDA uh, in 2023 is expected to come from Top Golf. We think it's roughly two thirds of the value. A lot of the questions uh, that people could raise against this company uh, appear to be answered, uh, you know, or you know, you could see it empirically happening now, and we think that gives it a very good chance to outperform uh, in the coming years. And what's your time horizon here? What are some time horizons folks could look at with Callaway? Yeah, well, we tend to invest for the longer term. Uh, we we look at a company like this and top golf has the ability to grow its sales you know well in the double digits for many many years to come so we hope to be holding this for, for many years and think it can be just generating value year after year uh you know that said in the shorter term the the mismatch between uh the stock price and the fundamentals going in opposite directions uh gives us much more confidence in the shorter term outlook that within this year uh, we expect uh, a lot of these open questions to be answered. Uh, you know, the, the co company like Topgolf has historically spent a lot of money uh, building out the venues. This year, not only will the whole company be free cash flow positive, but the Topgolf division will as well. Um, you know, another thing I mentioned, you're getting through the venture capital selling that that will be off the table. And then finally, you know, going back to you know management, the people who are the stewards of this company. Uh, we have confidence that they'll do the right thing. Uh, they, when you, you know, hear them talk on conference calls, are frustrated at, at the mismatch in their performance versus uh, you know what's going on with the valuation of the company. Uh, they have businesses and activists involved pre-pandemic. They have businesses they could sell to generate value, and and, and frankly, look, they they bought uh, Top Golf when it was you know 
relatively smaller and, you know, it was in a more vulnerable position. And now they uh, have proven that this concept, you know, is, is scaling up well, is, is very profitable. And I think that at some point they could consider a spin of the top golf uh, company or just spinning off the core assets if the mismatch persists for too long. Hi, I'm Raoul Pal, the CEO and co-founder of Real Vision. The financial world is a complicated world right now. It's a really complicated macro picture and there's a lot of risks. Real Vision and our YouTube channel help you navigate those risks. So subscribe now to the channel and never miss an update. There is simply too much going on. So subscribe now. Thank you. And you talked about some of those short-term goals that, that you'd like to see in the company you'd like to see. Do you have any, any short-term targets that might cause you to reassess at some point in this year? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think with a company like this uh, that, that does spend a lot of money on, on CapEx and a company where you are really betting on you know, the unit economics of the venues, you, we're going to pay a lot of attention to uh, you know, how that evolves. So if you started to see you know, the, the cost to build a venue go up a lot and you don't get commensurate returns, that would be the kind of thing that would give us pause. But we really haven't seen anything like that. You know, if anything, you know, they were flattish same venue sales at Topgolf when we first diligenced the company. And now they've accelerated uh, last couple of quarters around 11% uh, year over year, same venue sales. So, you know, th th those are, those are all, um, checking out, but there are things that we monitor on a regular basis because if it did go the wrong way, if the unit economics for, you know, a model where you're, you're rolling out an expansion deteriorated, that would, that would definitely change our mind. Yeah. So that, that would cause you to upend your view. And I'm just curious if we have a recession at the end of this year, like so many had, had forecasted though, those forecasts, you know, do shift regularly. It, how would, how would that change your view on the stock? I mean, I'm just thinking about your focus on these golf venues they have. Again, you see them as kind of high-end hangouts. If we do enter a recession in the second half of this year, would that completely upend your view? And would you think there would be a lot of pullback there? Yeah, look, the, 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 uh, the macro environment certainly impacts to some extent what's going on with the company's you know, revenue and fundamentals. But it looks to currently be pricing in a significant downdraft in, in, in revenue growth or profitability when you look at the valuation. So we think that's already in the stock. Um, when you look at things like, you know, leisure activities, you know, people gathering together and going out, these things I think are still in recovery mode uh, and there's a resiliency to them. Uh, when you look, whether it's this, or if you look at hotel companies, these are the kinds of businesses that are on a bit of a different cycle than things in the broader economy. It's like, when we think about what's going on in the macro, there's, uh, you know, you have goods that people may have overconsumed. So like one of the cliches is, well, grills. Yeah, grills were overconsumed. And, and then there's going to be a period of time where people consume a whole lot less of them. And this is the kind of thing that's still ramping up where there was, you know, very low consumption of, you know, going on vacations and going out and gathering for, you know, multiple years. And that's still ramping up to a normal level. And there's, there is more of a resiliency to that empirically uh, so far. Uh, and, you know, we, we expect that that to continue. That's not to say that same venue sales can't decelerate uh, on the margin, you know, if, you know, if there's a significant job loss or anything like that, but a lot of that's priced in and, uh, you know, we, we like the outlook. Let's jump right into your second idea, and that's CVS Group. Nothing to do with CVS Pharmacies in the U.S. It's actually a veterinary service provider here in the U.K. If we take a step back, zoom out, we see that this stock uh, peaked around September 2021 at 2550 GBX. That's, of course, pence, pennies, as opposed to pounds here in the UK. And then bottoms around June 2022 at 1,574 and currently trading just around 1,700. I was curious about this company as well, because, you know, a lot of people were expecting uh, people to abandon their pets and there had to be this whole post pandemic phase of animals you know, walking, uh, going about the streets. Uh, you don't see that though. No, no, we don't see that. Um, you know, quite, quite the opposite. I mean, you know, we'll get into the high level for the industry and the company, but, uh, 
the, the pet population in the UK is roughly 10% higher than it was pre-pandemic. Uh, you know, similar things in other Western countries. Um, there is not, we, you know, we check in on these things. There has not been a significant uh, decline in the pet population uh, now that uh, the pandemic is, you know, over for most. Um, so, so no, uh, you know, zooming out, uh, animal health, we think is a great industry to invest in. We've been following it closely for about a decade now. Uh, this is the kind of thing that we like to do where we we find, you know, oftentimes uh, you know, just a one-off investment, an industry that has a great secular growth theme, and we like to continue investing behind it, you know, investing behind something that has been successful for us in the past. Uh, so what drives animal health, the reason it's a good industry is the humanization of pets. So, you know, they'll say that the pet has gone from the backyard to the living room. Uh, to the bedroom, and with that, a propensity to spend more on on those pets. So, you know, you see that in everything from pet food, where you went from kibbles and bits to maybe you're feeding uh, your your dog, uh, you know, a clean label organic dog food or or raw meat. Uh, and similarly, you see it in vet clinics, where uh, a lot of things that were only done in human health, uh, for example, diagnosing you know injuries or illnesses using an MRI uh, or doing oncology treatment, things that now get get you know gone from um go from uh uh human to to veterinary health and the spending on that you know going up over time so those are all positive drivers and uh, additionally you see demographically where uh, for a lot of these things uh the younger demographics uh tend to view pets you know more as part of the family you know you even have this you know you have a pet before you get married kind of dynamic and yeah, younger people are buying pets younger and younger. The owners are getting younger and younger, not the not the pets. Right, right, right. And and so and then you get this other interesting dynamic. Um, so it's like you you look at uh, a lot of these companies. Uh, you know, you had a ten percent increase in in puppies, uh, pets in the UK, but you know, for vet clinics, for example, the spending, the real spending, uh, you know, for any given animal is really towards the end of their life, not at the beginning. So you actually haven't even seen the benefit. There's actually a long runway for that to continue to play out over time. Uh, so that's sort of high level. Um, you know, CVS Group is the second largest owner and operator of vet clinics in the UK. Uh, it's a company we've been following for a long time. Uh, we got involved uh, initially after they'd run into some operational issues. And this new management team came in and they've done a really great job. Uh, they improved the culture. They improved the margins and they improved the organic growth. And, you know, they proved themselves really also during the pandemic, uh, you know, minimal interruption, uh, operating well throughout. Um, what what we see, though, with this, this company, with this uh, stock, is that oftentimes there could be a pretty big mismatch also, you know, similar to what happened with Topgolf Callaway between the fundamentals uh, and what's going on with the stock price. So, uh, you know, as you can see, you look at the three-year, you know, five-year chart there, you know, company has done very well as, as the new management team has come in and made these improvements. Organic growth has accelerated. Um, right now, for some of the reasons that, that you raised, uh, there's this concern, oh, well, if it's a pandemic winner, then there must be some sort of, you know, uh, you know, uh, a drawdown in, in fundamentals that really isn't, isn't happening. Uh, organic growth has been very strong. The company's on its front foot. Uh, they're, uh, renovating uh, clinics to, you know, basically, you know, add equipment, nicer rooms, that all helps, uh, you know, improve organic growth. And then they're also doing bolt on acquisitions. And these are things they're actually increasing, you know, over the past year or so, and they're going to be ramping that up over the next five years. Their target is to double EBITDA. And I think right now that there's also some concern that, um, you know, with inflation, can these guys price, can these companies price to keep up and maintain their margins we actually think not only is there a long history of them pricing to keep up with inflation, uh, but the business is being run in, 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 a, in a thoughtful way, and they're actually able to expand their margins over time uh, doing through these things like the renovations, operating leverage because uh, of their scale. And you know, they're doing you know, smart things like getting you know, nurses to do more things that maybe in the past they had to use the veterinarians to do to just get more scale for the business. Uh, you know, Frankly, one of the things um, – one of the things that is a defining factor in uh, the veterinary industry 
uh, not just in the UK, but, but in a lot of the Western countries, including here, is there's a scarcity of labor and the company has done a really good job of being a best in class operator and doing best in uh, class uh, healthcare for the, the pets. And that's really helped attract a lot of talent and allowed them to recruit more than their fair share of vets uh, year in, year out recently. And that's allowing them to gain market share and it, it is supporting their growth. Um, when, when you look at it, you know, this people choose CVS group. They're not looking for the low price option. They're looking for quality pet care. So people, your customer is someone who's already, you know, leaning even more into the humanization of pets trend. And, um, that that's so that you know it's just like a positive feedback loop it helps both you know recruit more vets it helps you you know retain customers and, and not have sort of the economic headwinds where you see more of like people who would price shop uh at, you know at you know less expensive options maybe the people who in a downturn be more willing to pull back on pet care but 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 that's not what we're seeing here at cvs so we're we're pretty uh yeah pr- pretty optimistic about the outlook and just to be clear, I mean, you said that you got into this trade a while ago. For anybody who's hearing this and, and uses this as a starting point to, to start researching whether it interests them or not, you still see upside for this company, clearly? Oh, yeah. I, you know, it, what's great, so we, we try to invest in companies. Uh, a lot of our, the companies that we, we invest in are growing value at a fast rate. So we think this company is growing value, you know, 15 20% per year prospectively instead they're going to double EBITDA for the next five years. So what that allows is, you know, if there's a drawdown in the market, you have this, again, that mismatch between the, you know, the value of the company and where the stock price is that that spread getting wider. Uh, and, you know, that's certainly happened here. There's been many moments here where it was a really good opportunity to invest historically in this company. Uh, right now the stock's trading around 11, 12 times EBITDA um, on a forward basis. Uh, you've, the public, other public companies of vets have, have generally just been acquired um, over the years. Uh, there's been a lot of transactions in private markets, uh, and those those have typically ranged from about 15 times to 30 times even that. So you have a company, you're buying at a significant discount to uh, where private market transactions have occurred, and uh, it's growing value 15, 20% per year. So, you know, all, all of the reasons sort of like the, the negative narrative uh, about, you know, the economy or inflation, you know, you know impacting margins, all these things, these fears uh, that are out there have allowed it to get uh, you know, very cheap again. Uh, but uh, that, that's sort of how things go. And if you invest in a company that can and does execute on growing value at such a fast rate, uh, you can hold it for a long time and continue to do well. But then there will be moments when you know something happens and it gets extremely attractive again. And I think you know we're, we're we're somewhere around there again. And what if this stock doesn't go up materially in the next year? Well, um, you know, there's 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 lots of things that could cause that. I mean, I think people are looking for uh, the company to continue to execute on their M and A strategy as well. You know, if that you know went on pause or they they. they you know, they were, they're going to look to maybe expand in the continent. And if they change their mind on that, these are things that could keep the stock from going up. But, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, there's a history of these companies getting acquired. Uh, this is well known in the private equity industry. Uh, I think that there's a limit to how low the valuation can can remain at for, for a long period of time before people get interested in uh, in taking a look at it. And what would cause you to upend your view? on this company, on CVS Group? Yeah, you know, so I, I think one of the big things is margins. So if there, if there really did ever become a reason that we thought that um, the company was going to, uh, you know, suffer from significant market de- degradation, you know, they couldn't price for labor costs, uh, or, the, you know, there were some operational missteps where they started to lose a lot of, of their labor force. Like, these are the kinds of things that would really sort of, you know, upset the fundamentals of the company. Uh, we don't see any evidence of that. Um, that was, you know, potentially the case uh, when we first uh, started looking at it. Uh, but it, it, they, they've certainly read, read the ship. And you have a time horizon for, for this idea for, for your company? Yeah, I mean, it's similar, uh, you know, to Topgolf Callaway for us, where uh, we think that this can grow value, you know, for a long period of time. We hope to hold it for many more years. Um, you know, that said, it, it's the past, as you, as you noted, it, 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 roughly a year and a half where it has uh, underperformed. 
and uh, you know the pent up mismatch gives us uh, you know a lot of confidence on the outlook uh, in the upcoming year. Let's jump into your third idea, and that's LAM Research. This is an American supp supplier of equipment used to create semiconductors. And if we zoom out, we see in December of 2021 trading about $722, a far cry from where it ended up around $320 in October of 2022, though it's staged a real comeback, though still trading below that 722 peak, trading about $520 right now. So tell us about this company and, and why it might interest people now. Sure. Yeah. Well, high level. Uh, so LAM makes equipment that you need to make semiconductors. So, uh, you know, these, these fabrication facilities, uh, they're very expensive uh, and they rely on monopolistic suppliers. So if you want to build a new modern fabrication facility to make memory chips or to make logic chips, which will go into your iPhone, uh, you, you need their equipment. There is no alternative. Um, and so, you know, that's a really interesting starting point. It's obviously become a big part of geopolitics as well and industrial policy. Um, so high level, when you think about semiconductors, the industry has been growing about 8% per year. And in order to support, you know, the growth of that industry, you need to build more uh, manufacturing facilities, which they call fabs, um, to support the growth. The cost of building the fabs, though, has gone up in recent years, and that's what got us pretty interested in following the industry. So you have, uh, you know, the revenue growth of the total pie is 8% per year. Uh, it's forecast to be similar, but the cost of the equipment to support it is going to go up over time, and that's because the uh, – as the chips, as you're shrinking what you put on the chips more and more, the sophistication and the complexity of the equipment goes up. So they just cost more. And so you have these great companies uh, with dominant positions and they're going to charge for it and they have. So, you know, for example, a fabrication facility in 2015 cost around 10 billion. Today, a leading edge fab will cost 20. So you've just seen a huge increase. And so that's really supported you know, lambs growth, uh, you know, similarly with the industrial policy, uh, you know, the U S uh, the West really pioneered semiconductors and its manufacturing, but we allowed the policy, we allowed, you know, the factories to, you know, really shift over time into Asia. And now there's a very conscious effort, you know, the chips act and many other uh, pieces of legislation to shift manufacturing back uh, into the West. And there's a lot of capital behind that. And all of those things are going to support, you know, the growth of this industry over time. Uh, so, you know, LAM specifically, uh, what they do is, uh, you know, their equipment as it's being used has been gaining market share over time. And that's allowed them to become a better business at higher margins and, and uh, more stability. So that's sort of like high level uh, what's going on. And what is your time horizon for, for this idea? We think we think it's very interesting. Uh, you know, right now it's it's so Lamb historically has grown earnings over the past ten years. It's grown earnings over thirty percent per year. So it's executed really well. It, the business has undergone a transformation. It's not fully appreciated by a lot of people in the market. So you know, uh, historically, semiconductor stocks, semi cap, so semi, which is what Lamb is. Uh, they have been very cyclical companies dominated by traders and it's just people trying to call the turn and less focused on sort of the high level what's going on you know these businesses have you know their margins have increased over time and uh instead of being valued as sort of like new industrial companies they're being valued more on you know uh is next quarter going to miss? Are the earnings revisions going to start? You know, are they going to stop going down? Are they going to go up? And uh, right now, everyone's pricing in, you know, rightfully so, that this this company is going to have a down year in in twenty twenty three, and that's the opportunity because you want to be buying these stocks. It's we consider it a growth cyclical. You want to be buying these stocks uh, when there's a downturn, because uh, otherwise, you know, it, it gets harder to, to justify. The best time to buy them is is when you know, something negative has happened. Uh, so when we look at it, we think it can do over $50 a share in normalized earning. Uh, as you said, the stock's trading around $500 right now. Uh, and it will keep growing from there. So 
you know, we think it's it's a very interesting opportunity and it's very, uh, I'd say, contrarian for a lot of people because they are either used to thinking about LAM as a, you know, a trading stock or they're worried about going into the downturn, but they don't have any confidence based on sort of, you know, the broader understanding of what's going on in, in semiconductors to hold it through the cycle. And we think that's where you, you, know, you, can, you can have success. Again, the company, uh, the stock has done very well and the company grew earnings over 30% per year for a decade. So it certainly has the ability to grow value for you. You just have to, you know, be willing to, you know, ride out some of the volatility and you know the best the best way to do it is if you can get in uh you know when uh a time like this when there's uh you know a downturn uh, coming and, and any time specific targets that you have <laughs> it, it, it's it, 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 a bit of a broken record it's a similar thing where uh after last year uh 2022 uh there was such negativity price and and, and rightfully in this industry unlike the other two uh it became clear that uh, earnings were going to go down in 2023 because of the export controls the U.S. put in place, uh, you know, to to keep China from catching up on semiconductors, um, and and then also just the you know the economy slowing down on some of you know consumer goods, you know, PCs and cell phones and all that. Uh, there was going to be a down year in in 2023, so that that caused the downturn. Um, but now these stocks tend to bottom, you know, roughly six months prior to the fundamentals. So we think it's it's a pretty interesting time as we're coming out of this. You know, we're going, we're, we're right about to go into this downturn. And we're going to be coming out of it pretty quickly. And you have a six month lead. And Eric, my favorite question, I think, is always the most revealing about investors. What would make you realize that you were wrong about this idea? Clearly, geopolitics and policy play a huge role in this one, onshoring versus offshoring. But aside from that? Yeah, uh, I think the big thing is looking at the, the experience on the ground of are they gaining market share? Is there reception for their technology? Uh, if that were to change, if something about the technology roadmap were to shift, that would be the big, big red flag. Um, you know, so far, uh, over, over time, they've been gaining market share and their technology is increasingly used to, to manufacture chips. But that is the critical point you have to believe. Uh, and, you know, so far, that, that very much appears to be the case. And of course, with these types of trades, you're always looking at competitors to see if they have more efficient technologies coming along, which... You know, it does happen. Just ask the folks at uh, BlackBerry. Right. Well, yeah, but, the, you know, the, 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 that's that's true. Uh, the, the thing about this industry, though, is um, the competitive advantage is actually quite large. Um, and it's really being stress tested right now. Uh, you know, if, if China could, they would spend, you know, many, many, many billions of dollars uh, and, and manpower to try to replicate this industry. I mean, there's news stories of them you know, stealing technology, most recently from ASML to try to catch up. But that just hasn't worked historically. Uh, there's a natural monopolistic uh, nature to this industry because uh, once you develop technology that, you know, is better at solving the problem of manufacturing chips uh, with, you know, more content and at a cheaper price, everyone starts using you and then it becomes a positive feedback loop where you get the data from your customers and it, and your competitors just start to fade away. And that's been the empirical reality over the past several decades or a few decades. Uh, the easiest one to understand is ASML. Um, I mean, no one is really trying to compete with them anymore. And the same thing is true uh, with LAM research and many of uh, the pieces of equipment they provide to do certain steps uh, of the, the manufacturing process. And so it is possible, uh, but, uh, you know, it hasn't worked. Uh, you know, the, there was a great book uh, recently uh, called Chip Wars uh, about the history of the semiconductor industry. And I, I was reading that and I, I learned about how the Soviets, when they tried to catch up to us on semiconductors and, and, and how and why they failed, uh, you know, all, all these things that rhyme with what's going on today. But, you know, one thing is, is they guaranteed uh, that they wouldn't succeed when they kept trying to buy our current technology and then copy it, because that just guaranteed that they were going to be years behind us. Uh, so even if they had the the, uh, the ability uh, and then the know-how, uh, you know, without the uh, built-in advantage of 
you know, being ahead of the curve and using your customers' data and having these big capital markets uh, that you can help use to uh, improve your products, uh, they're just structurally behind. And it, it, the same thing it, it appears to be true today as well. But if it changes, we'll, we'll change our mind. Well, Eric Judoff, always fascinating to use those historical references as viewpoints for today and what's coming up. Eric Judoff, Managing Partner and Co-CIO at Marlowe Partners. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Well, let's jump right into my takeaways from that discussion with Eric. His first idea is Top Golf Callaway Brands. He sees this stock is very cheap right now, and he believes that management is executing well. Even though he's a long-term investor, he sees a real mismatch right now between the stock performance and the performance of the executive. So that mismatch, he believes, there will be a snapback from that in the short term. Uh, he says you have to keep an eye on that stock, though, because if that mismatch were to continue, he believes that there would be a spinoff or a sale of one of the divisions of the company, which could fundamentally change the, the outlook for that company. It, number two was his idea around CVS Group, not the pharmacies. It's the services for veterinary clinics here in the UK. This is part of a broader idea that we've actually heard Eric talk about before, having to do with the humanification of pets, pets moving from backyards into homes, living rooms, and even bedrooms. So he's making making bets on that in many different companies. In the short term, he also sees a mismatch here. He believes that if the stock doesn't go up materially, that somebody else will come in and buy that company. So you'd have to keep a close eye on that. He thinks if there were some type of mismanagement that he saw of clinics and the numbers, that would cause him to fundamentally up and his view. And his third idea was around Lamb Research. That's a company that helps uh, build equipment for manuf manufacturing facilities for semiconductors. He sees that they're going into a down cycle right now. So of all of the ideas, it really sounded like this one uh, was had a, a, an easy time in right now. Uh, he's a long-term holder in here. And fundamentally, it sounded like what would make him up and his view had really to do with geopolitics and policy. The onshoring policies of the U.S. government right now are making a fundamental shift in that company's stock. And if that were to change, he would have to reassess. Thanks for all the feedback that you've given us. Let us know what you think about Eric and these ideas right here in the comments section. And I'll see you guys again in a couple of weeks. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.